And welcome back to High School Physics Explained. And today I want to discuss the concept of satellites in orbit. And in particular, I want to discuss uh, the energy values of those satellites. Before we start, let's quickly review two things. The first thing I would like to review is the whole concept of orbital velocity. So here I have a satellite that is moving around in an orbit. What is its velocity? And I've previously discussed this in a video which you can access at the link up the top. You know that the velocity can be determined by understanding that the gravitational force is equal to the centripetal force. When you use that formula of gravitation, formula mg m1 m2 over r squared, and you equal that to mv squared over r, when you rearrange that equation, you get a formula of v equals the square root of g m over r. Now, why is this formula important? Well, because if we're wanting to understand kinetic energy, which is the energy of a moving object, we need to know something about its velocity. So this formula will come in handy shortly. The second concept you need to be familiar with is the concept of potential energy. In my previous video, again, the link is provided you at the top. I discussed the, the idea of that gravitational potential energy. It is the work done moving a satellite. So let's say this satellite over here from a point that is an infinite point away to such a distance that it is a distance of r away from the center of the earth. So the gravitational potential energy, which is GPE, and from here on, I'm going to use the accepted symbol for gravitational potential energy as U, that ends up being equaling zero at a distance or r value of infinity. So the formula ends up being negative g m1 m2 over r. Now, why is it negative? I discussed this in the video, but in essence is that if I move my object away from the Earth, I'm doing work, I'm increasing its gravitational potential energy. It's zero at this end, so all these values are negative. To make it clear, there is a graph related to this. If we examine the gravitational potential energy of an object as it moves away from the center of the object, we get a graph that looks like this. It tends to zero, and it is always going to be in the negative value. So now we're in a position to discuss gravitational potential energy, kinetic energy, and thus the combined energy of a satellite. So let's examine our satellite that is in orbit around the Earth. What is the total energy of this satellite? The energy is equal to the sum of the gravitational potential energy plus the kinetic energy at that situation. That is, it's in orbit, so therefore it has gravitational potential energy, but of course it also has a velocity around the Earth and therefore it has kinetic energy. Now the gravitational potential energy is equal to negative g m1 m2 over r. Of course m1 is going to be our Earth and m2 is going to be the satellite's mass. The kinetic energy is simply a half m2, the mass of a satellite, multiplied by its velocity squared. Now this would be nice if it was cleaned up so that we don't have v as a variable in our equation. But you remember that v is equal to the square root of g m over r. So v squared is simply equal to g m over r. So now what we have is negative g m1 m2 over r, our gravitational potential energy, plus a half multiplied by m2 multiplied by v squared, which is g m over r. Can you see what's going on? Let me clean it up for you. I have the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy as g m1 m2 over 2r. In other words, the kinetic energy is equal to negative a half of the gravitational potential energy. So the total energy is simply equal to u plus negative a half of u, which means what we get is negative g m1 m2 over 2r. The total energy of our satellite is also negative. You increase it as you move away from the Earth, you have to do work on it, 
but the total energy at an infinite point away is going to tend towards zero. Now, if I have my satellite, therefore, going into a higher orbit like so, I am going to be increasing the radius. Its velocity is going to decrease due to this formula here, but the total energy is still greater than it was in the first position. Here is an example of a question where we can use the concept of energy to understand what's going on with our satellite. So I have a satellite placed in a geostationary orbit and we want to know what the minimum energy required is to place that satellite in that orbit. So the minimum energy required is going to be the change in energy from the final energy minus the initial energy. So we need to calculate what the initial energy is over here. We need to work out what the final energy is over here, and then we subtract them. So let's concentrate first on the final energy. Now the final energy, so EF, is equal to negative G M1 M2 over 2R. We need to know R. How do we establish R? Well, that's simply worked out using Kepler's third law. So if I were to go and determine the radius I need to work out this variable, I can simply use r cubed over t squared is equal to gm over 4 pi squared. Now t is 24 hours. The mass of the Earth, 5.97 by 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. And as long as you use the SI unit for time, you're going to get a radius equaling 4.223 by 10 to the power of 7 meters. If you substitute that down into this equation, you're going to get to get negative 6.67 by 10 to the power of negative 11, the mass of the Earth and the mass of the satellite, divided by two times the radius which we establish as 4.223 by 10 to the power of 7 you get an answer that ends up being negative 2.36 by 10 to the power of 10 joules. So there's a final energy. But what about at launch? Well, at launch, it has a certain velocity. So the velocity can be determined at launch simply by understanding that 2 pi r, that is the circumference, divided by the period. Of course, it's stationary on the Earth, but it's spinning. So it's still going around at a period of 24 hours. And so we're going to get two times pi multiplied by the radius of the Earth, which is 6.37 by 10 to the power of six, divided by 24 by 60 by 60. That gives us a value of 463.2 meters per second. So we are all traveling, at least if you're sitting on the equator, at 463.2 meters per second. So the initial energy that we have is going to be equal to the sum total of the kinetic energy you have plus the gravitational potential energy you have. So that's going to be a half mv squared plus negative gm1 m2 over r initially. And of course, this is simply you sitting on the surface. I'm going to get you to do the calculations and if you calculate that out you're going to get a value of negative 3.12 by 10 to the power of 11 joules. So there's our initial. So our change in energy is going to be simply equal to the difference between the two values we worked out and you're going to get a value of 2.88 by 10 to the power of 11 joules, or you could say 288 gigajoules of energy supplied to launch our satellite into a geostationary orbit. But not all satellites are in perfect circular orbits. Many satellites are in what we call an elliptical orbit. And Kepler's second law states that it's traveling faster at the closest position and slower at the furthest position. Now that's consistent with our understanding how kinetic energy decreases as we move further away. The distance that is the closest to the Earth is referred to as the perigee, and it's measured from the surface of the Earth. The distance measured from the furthest position away from the Earth is called the apogee. 
and different satellites have different perigees and different apogees. The total energy at the perigee is equal to the total energy at the apogee. In other words, we could say that E is equal to the gravitational potential energy at the apogee plus the kinetic energy at the apogee and that is equal to the gravitational potential energy at the perigee plus the kinetic energy at the perigee. We can use this relationship to establish any changes in velocity, knowing that the kinetic energy is of course always equal to a half mv squared. One final question, and I'm not going to do it all for you because you're capable of doing that yourself. And the question is, this radiation belt storm probe, which is a real satellite, was launched in 2012, has a perigee of 595.4 kilometers and an apogee of 30,432.4 kilometers. Its speed at the perigee is 9.83 kilometers per second. What is its speed at the apogee? So let's label our diagram. We're told that this distance here is 595.4 kilometers. At the apogee, we're told it's equal to 30,432 kilometers. When at this position, we know its velocity is equal to 9.83 kilometers per second. We're wanting to know what is its velocity at this particular point in time. I would suggest you pause right now and try to work out the velocity. You should get is 1869 meters per second if you've done it correctly. Now let's say you don't know how to do it but I'll guide you what you need to do. You know that the total energy is always going to be equal to the sum of the kinetic energies and the gravitational potential energy and the total energy remains constant. So we can say that a half mv at the perigee squared plus negative g m1 m2 over r, in other words the gravitational potential energy at the perigee equals a half mv, now this is at the apogee squared, plus negative g m1 m2 over r, and r here is at the apogee. r is going to be equal to the total distance from the center. So in each case, ra is going to equal to 6,371 kilometers plus the 30,432, but you have to multiply that by a thousand to work out in meters. You do this similarly on the other side. Also remember that the value I gave you is in kilometers per second, so the value for velocity will be in meters per second. But that in essence is the mathematics that you have to utilize. As long as you substitute you know, everything in the correct ICU SI unit, and you correctly identify that r is the total distance from the center of the body, you should be able to work out the velocity. So let's quickly summarize what we've learned. If you remember this diagram here, we discussed the gravitational potential energy is negative g m1 m2 over r. We've also established that the kinetic energy is equal to positive g m1 m2 over 2r, thereby the total energy is equal to negative g m1 m2 over 2r. That means if you look at these three variables that u ends up being twice of the total energy. That the total energy is equal to the negative of the kinetic energy and that two times the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy ends up being zero. If we look at this in a graphical form and now what we do is we label with different colors the two types of energy. And let's say make U yellow. So we know that the gravitational potential energy is going to look something like this. It's going to be that curve that we've discussed before. If we then look at the kinetic energy, it's going to be a positive value, but it's going to be a slightly or half that of the gravitational potential energy. If we then look at the total energy, it's going to sit in between like so. And in fact, this K 
and this E graph are mirror images of each other because of this relationship. It means that the kinetic energy, the total energy, and the gravitational potential energy all tend to zero, but clearly at different rates. So if my satellite moves to a new position, I increase its gravitational potential energy. Clearly, I have to do work on it. So I'm putting energy into the system. And as a result, I have an increase in gravitational potential energy. I have clearly an increase in total energy, but the satellite will go slower and it'll decrease in terms of kinetic energy. Not at the same value, mind you, because still a changing of gravitational potential energy will have a more significant effect on the total energy than it does on the kinetic energy. Similarly speaking, if I move it down to a lower orbit, I'm going to increase its kinetic energy. But the change in gravitational potential energy is a much larger value than the change in kinetic energy. Now, some of you will be saying, but hold on, if I increase an object's gravitational potential energy, then the value of the kinetic energy change would be the same value. In other words, a loss in kinetic energy would mean a gain in gravitational potential energy and vice versa. And that, of course, is the law of conservation of mechanical energy. But why this looks different is because we assumed this to be in a uniform gravitational field. And you see that when we look at a much larger perspective, that is where we move objects within a varying gravitational field, then that relationship does not hold. This is the key relationship that holds. Well, I hope that helps you understand the concepts. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share, and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.